Hello everyone, this is Bhavik Choksi here and I hope you guys are doing great. In today's video, we would be covering all the amendments and changes which are applicable for the CA final FR November 2022 attempt. Broadly, we have subdivided the changes as those which are due to an India's notification which is there in your RTP of November 2022. And secondly, the changes which are pertaining to Schedule 3 and other COVID related amendments which are also separately discussed in uh, another video but nevertheless we have got everything together in a one page note so uh, before we start i'll just again be very clear there are no significant or material amendments which are there in november 2022 but it is very natural for a student to feel anxious when they see five pages in rtp for a particular thing or a few uh, uh, pages on schedule three somewhere else so what we have done is we have just summarized everything which is relevant for you in a single one pager note you can just refer that one pager note refer this video and proceed uh, keep your uh, anxiety at rest and proceed with the remainder of the syllabus having said that these points don't really have a lot of impact in your solutions but nevertheless from an understanding standpoint and a mental peace standpoint we need to cover that so let us get started so over here firstly there was a notification which was there uh, by the MCA on 23rd of March 2020-2022 which is applicable from the year 22-23 and it prescribed a few changes in a few standards to bring it in line with the annual changes that happen in IFRS and India's. So what are those changes? Broadly those changes are pertaining to six specific standards. First, we have India 16 on property, plant and equipment. A lot of these changes, to be honest, are clarificator in nature. So, under India 16, if you are testing before commercial production and as a part of the testing, you manufacture certain goods, products and you kind of sell them off. Again, we have not started commercial production. We are, we are testing the product and as a part of that testing, you will incur certain expenses to test. These expenses will obviously be capitalized under India 16 because they are directly attributable expenses necessary to get the asset in the ready to use condition. Sometimes the products, you give it to the local community, let us say for a concessional price, you might get certain sale proceeds. What do you do with the sale proceeds? Sir, we deduct it from the cost. Why? Because the directly attributable cost has been added and hence sale proceeds, if any, received on that should be deducted. Only the net amount should be considered. Now, this is something that we were earlier doing and we will continue doing. In fact, there is a small change in IFRS. They have prescribed some other treatment. However, our institute has con continued with the same treatment. They have prescribed a carve out. And from an exam standpoint, you do the exact same treatment that you were doing earlier. That is, any directly attributable cost which is linked to testing a product before commercial production will be added to the cost. And any proceeds that you get from selling those items that you might have manufactured will be reduced from the cost. Sir, what if, what if hypothetically the cost of testing of running the test is 100 rupees and we get 120 on selling? Well, even if you get 120 on selling, that is you add 100 and subtract 120, your cost overall will reduce by a net of 20. That is again fine. The standard makes it amply clear that you will not credit the PNL. Well, we were not even crediting the PNL earlier and hence as such, there's no material change. Point number one. Point number two, comes in Indus 37. In Indus 37, there's a provision of onerous contract, which is a burdensome contract. That is the cost of fulfilling or exiting the contract is greater than the benefit that you get out of the contract for which you create a provision for losses on the onerous contract. Now, what do you do in case of onerous contract? Well, as per the standard, you will create a provision for the onerous contract. But how will you find the onerous element, the burdensome element, the loss element? You will look at the cost of fulfilling the contract or the penalty to exit the contract. Now, earlier there was no guidance given on what was what should be included in the cost of fulfilling the contract. Obviously, the cost of fulfilling will include the incremental cost, the additional cost, like for example, some additional material, some additional labor, some additional expenses that you have to incur to fulfill the contract or the cost of exiting. But do we take only the incremental cost? Well, incremental cost like materials, labor, etc. is still to be taken. However, the standard clarifies over here that even allocable overheads, directly allocable costs, like for example, a machine has been used for the purpose of manufacturing 
a particular uh, 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 asset which is going to be used in a contract which is let us say burdensome or onerous then even the depreciation of that machine is allocable directly to that contract and hence the cost over here will be the entire cost not just incremental cost it will obviously include the incremental cost however even the allocation of directly attributable cost like depreciation on assets etc should be added and then you will compare so for example let us say the cost of fulfilling the contract let us assume there are no benefits that you are going to get out of the contract hypothetically then the cost of fulfilling the contract can be the incremental cost like materials labor of 100 50 rupees let us say as other uh, directly allocable cost and hence your total cost comes to let us say 150 rupees the penalty for exiting the contract let us say is 120 rupees earlier you might have compared 100 with 120 now instead of comparing 100 you will compare 150 and 120 and select whichever is a lower which is let us say 120 basically allocable items directly allocable expenses will be considered as cost of fulfillment as well over here that is the second amendment third is india's 103 again there are a lot of nomenclature linked changes like there is a new conceptual framework in place and as a result as a part of the new conceptual framework which is applicable to the standard setters a few terminology changes are there though they are absolutely not relevant at least uh, in this standard perspective in India 103 the standard on business combination there are two particular changes again not very significant first contingent liabilities typically at the stage of business combination if you're taking over a contingent liability and that meets the recognition criteria you will record it at fair value that is prescribed under index 103 however there is a specific guidance which is there under index 37 for levies like if uh, there is an electricity company then it will have certain levies which are its liabilities which are payable to the government now these levies are accounted for as per a specific appendix that is appendix c, c to index 37 and hence the standard in order to give coverage to these levies let us say there's an electricity company which has to pay a levy to a particular state board then even if there's a business combination then will you recognize these levies well the standard says that even at the stage of business combination you will recognize a levy if it is permitted to be recorded as per appendix c to index 37 that's it so if a levy has to be recognized at the stage of business combination it should be permitted to be recognized at the stage of uh, index 37 levy guidance Secondly, contingent assets. Typically, contingent assets are not recorded even at the stage of business combination. Uh, earlier, it was an implied understanding. Now, it is specifically mentioned so that there is no ambiguity that contingent assets should not be recorded. Remember, reimbursement assets can continue to be recorded. Like if you are recording a contingent liability and there is an indemnification or reimbursement that can continue to be recorded. We are speaking of a pure contingent asset uh, uh, which is there. Let us say uh, uh, the selling company uh, uh, had put a lawsuit on someone or there was an insurance claim that the selling company uh, was pursuing. All of these are contingent assets which are still not permitted to be recorded even at the stage of business combination which is specifically mentioned. Okay, next is India's 101. In any case, this is first time adoption. This is on a very specific and a very uh, 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 a very minute aspect. So from an exam standpoint, not very important. Uh, now, the general understanding of FCTR, Foreign Currency Translation Reserve, is you can reset it to zero value at the stage of transition. However, in case at the stage of transition, uh, there is a parent company, there is a subsidiary company, and subsidiary transitions to India's after the parent. Now, when will that happen? Probably it's a foreign company to which... Uh, uh, we were not uh, uh, applying indes now indes becomes applicable or it was like a bank or an nbfc or some other reason let us say the subsidiary was not applying indes but the parent was applying indes and hence for the purpose of consolidation even though the subsidiary would be preparing its accounts as per its local gap at the consolidation stage it will have to prepare its accounts restated using Indes. Now, since the parent was consolidating the subsidiary earlier and it was taking probably the restated Indes financials for the subsidiary, there may already be an FCTR which was calculated by the parent. Now, the standard over here says that in case a subsidiary or a joint venture transitions to Indes after 
the parent as transition then apart from having a choice to reset the fctr to zero you can also continue to take the fctr as appearing in the parents consolidated books as the index value remember such a guidance was always available for assets and liabilities but fctr is actually a reserve and hence a separate clarification is given like if a subsidiary moves to uh, 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 if there's a parent and then the subsidiary later moves to index like an NBFC or a bank then the parent in the books of the parents the index values for the subsidiary might already be there and as a result you can take that as the values for the purpose of transition even in the individual books now along with the asset and liability values you can also take the reserve or the FCTR value so there are two choices you can take the FCTR to zero value or in a special case that is when subsidiary is transitioning to index after the parent then the FCTR value if any in the parent's CFS attributable to that subsidiary can also be continued that is a previous gap value but in a very special case otherwise resetting to zero is generally permitted. Index 109 there is a provision in index 109 on derecognition of financial liability in case of substantial modification. Uh, of loan terms then you can derecognize the existing loan and create a new loan at this stage should you consider the fees the transaction cost at the stage of derecognition at the stage of renegotiation the answer is yes even in the old standard uh, or uh, the existing provisions you will consider the transaction cost because that's a cash outflow so when we are trying to find the present value of modified cash flows or even the revised cash flows at the old IR, old EIR or even the new EIR, you will consider the transaction cost, which is the same provision. You are still going to consider the transaction cost, just that they have defined what the transaction cost can include. So they have mentioned that the transaction cost can include the fees which is paid by the borrower to or on behalf of the lender. Or it may sometimes be the other way around where the lender has paid fees and the borrower is receiving the fees. So the net amount, so let us say the borrower for some reason has paid 100 rupees as transaction cost and the lender has paid 20 rupees to the borrower and hence the net amount of 80 rupees will be considered, which was earlier also considered, which is now also considered. It is just a clarificatory provision as we say. And lastly, in DES 41, generally in index 41 fair value is given but in case you have to determine the fair value the standard over here says that you have to take the post tax cash flows so while determining the fair value you will take the post tax cash flows for the purpose of fair value determination just to give you perspective when we were doing index 36 uh, uh, and we try to find the recoverable value the recoverable value is calculated as value in use or the fair value less cost to sell and when you take the value in use you take the pre-tax cash flows the pre-tax discount rate here you need to take the post-tax cash flows for the purpose of agriculture fair value determination this is not recoverable value okay so these are the amendments which are there in your rtp you will see a good four or five sides and in fairly tricky language so probably if uh, you are comfortable you can refer this small half pager for that and uh, hopefully that should ease your nerves get you give you confidence to proceed in your exam most of these as you are aware are the treatments that you already do uh, in your in your syllabus so there's no material change as such second there are a few other changes which we have already discussed as a part of the part 3 I've uh, put the new sums added in May 22 and in that at the end of the third part we had made a small discussion about the conceptual framework as well as schedule 3 so uh, the changes in schedule 3 are also more of disclosure changes and don't really affect the way in which a student solves a business combination consolidation or any other type of question. However, for the purpose of an overall understanding, we'll just quickly run through the changes mostly of the disclosure for Schedule 3 and also in Index 116, the practical expedient for rent concession which was earlier till 30th of June 2021 was extended up to 30th June 22. So this is probably the last attempt where that rent concession remains relevant though it is not very important. The COVID-19 related questions do not have a lot of importance uh, at least in these attempts but having said that theoretically it continues to remain applicable because it, it is applicable to 30th June 2022. So the last date for rent concession applicability is 30th June 2022 which uh, can be considered as applicable for you 
and then there are a few changes in schedule 3 these are changes largely to bring the financials in line with the requirements of caro 2020 as well so what are the changes well you need to disclose the shareholdings of the promoter at the year end as well as a percentage change which is during the year as well nothing significant over here the rounding off is now based on the total income that is there and not really based on the turnover so rounding off into lakhs millions crores etc trade receivables and trade payables you need to give an aging schedule for both of them which will be less than six months between six and twelve between one to two years two to three years and about three years a similar aging schedule is also now required to be given for capital work in progress and intangibles under development a disclosures need to be given for tangible and intangible assets specifically if there are changes of more than 10 percent during a time period and if there is a revaluation of property plant and equipment also for intangible property then you need to mention whether this was done this fair value was determined by a registered valuer or not Achha. Title deeds for immobile property, usually the immobile property has to be in your name, but if it is not in your name, if it is in someone else's name, then you need to mention these properties and reasons why it is not in your name. Charge details, uh, as you might have studied in inter law, if you are taking a, pro a loan and you are giving something as a security, it's a charge. That charge has to be registered once the loan is repaid, that the satisfaction of the charge should also be registered. If you have not registered or uh, this, you need to mention that and give reasons for the same. The only thing which I would state as even slightly important is this part over here, which is the current maturity of long term borrowings. Well, if there was a long term loan of 10 years of 100 rupees and which is repayable 10, 10 rupees each year, then typically 10 rupees is current, the remaining 90 is non current. This 10 rupees was earlier classified within other current liabilities or other financial liabilities. Now it is to be shown as a part of short term borrowings. So this current portion of long term debt should be shown as a part of short term borrowings. There are a couple of other provisions which are linked to borrowings. So if you have taken a borrowings, typically there is some utilization requirement. So you have to mention whether funds have been utilized for that purpose and if not, for what purpose have they been utilized. If you have been uh, designated as a willful defaulter, you have to disclose the same if applicable. If you have done transactions with any defunct or uh, companies which have been struck off the registrar, you have to give the names. Uh, of these companies. If loans are granted to the promoters, KMPs, uh, related parties, you'll have to give the details of those transactions and uh, other, uh, uh, other prescribed particulars. Reconciliation has to be provided with bank statements. So a lot of times when you take borrowings, you have to give quarterly, monthly statements to the banks. And ideally, these statements should tally with your annual financial statements reported. If they are not tallying, you'll have to give the reasons why. Of deviation. The next thing is slightly important where you'll have to disclose ratios, a lot of ratios, current ratio, quick ratio, debt service ratio, debt to equity ratio. A lot of these ratios have to be given and if there's a deviation of greater than 25%, reasons for the deviation should also be given. Schemes of arrangements, if any, uh, uh, have been entered, then the impact of the schemes and deviation, if any, from uh, in the treatment prescribed as per India's, you'll have to give that schemes of amalgamation, etc. If there was certain undisclosed income which has been voluntary or involuntarily detected and disclosed has to be mentioned. Benami property, uh, uh, you will have to disclose if any proceedings have been going on or completed for Benami properties. For CSR, in an, uh, any case you are giving a CSR report but now as a part of your notes to accounts you will have to give the details of amount spent, expenditure incurred, shortfall, reasons etc. And lastly cryptocurrency and virtual assets, you will have to disclose the profit and loss during the period uh, the cryptocurrency balances that you have and advances if any that parties have given or you have given in cryptocurrency so this is that one page thing which you should refer and get this amendment out of your way again this continues to even obviously remain applicable for the may 2023 and onward students as well so even uh, even if you are uh, let us say May 23 or a subsequent attempt student, this remains applicable and it is important that you just listen to this short video and get this out of your way once and for all. I hope this session has been helpful. Thank you very much for your time and patience. I'll see you soon with some other uh, uh, relevant videos. Good luck. Goodbye. Take care.